Raider Nation. Thank you for joining us on the Only Nation podcast, brought to you by the Raider Ramble and sponsored by Betway. My name is Heidi, but you may know me as Kevlar Prom Dress or even Raider Ladybug. I'm here with T3 Raider Facts, and we're ready to talk some Raiders football together. Well, Heidi, we outraided ourselves on Thursday night, so now we take a 5-8 and eight record and we'll try to carve out a winning season. That's going to be our playoffs. Today on the show... We'll talk about what happened last Thursday night against the Rams and then look ahead to a home date with New England, hoping to start a new winning streak. Okay, Raider Nation, we would love to hear from you. So here's how you can get in touch with us. Give us a call on the Only Nation podcast voicemail line at 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. You can also check us out on the web at onlynationpod.com. Here's the latest Raider news. The Las Vegas Raiders traveled back to SoFi Stadium in Los Angeles last Thursday night and took a 16-3 lead into the fourth quarter. But the newly acquired Baker Mayfield led the Rams on two fourth-quarter scoring drives, including a touchdown drive with just a minute 45 left and no timeouts, giving the underdog Rams the 17-16 victory. And I want to make one comment here, and this is not to throw Baker Mayfield under the bus, although everybody thinks he's the next best thing since sliced bread since he led that comeback. But let me tell you, when you have a good coach on the sidelines, and, and I consider McVay a really good coach, he was pumping information into Baker's ear the whole time and telling him exactly what to do. When you have a coach on the sidelines that you trust in, that has a winning pedigree and you know can get you down the field if you do what he tells you to do, that makes all the difference in the world. Derek Carr, I don't think, has that. So, again, Baker Mayfield, can you can say what you want about him being the leader. He made a couple of throws, yes, but the Raiders bailed him out on quite a few penalties there toward the end. Now, the, the, the loss can be penned on a number of different things, not one thing individually. But, again, this wasn't Baker's show. Yeah, what we saw, the Raiders players did throw it away. They really did. But what we really did see was Josh McDaniels being outcoached by Sean McVay. That's what it really comes down to. And outcoached he was. It wasn't even funny. It was really sad. And they kept flashing back to the sidelines. And you you could see McVeigh giving information, giving instructions to Mayfield. And I thought, man, if we just had that on the other sideline, we just don't see that. It would be really interesting to see what Sean McVeigh could do with the Raiders team this year. In my opinion, if we had Sean McVeigh as coach, we would be at least, at least – Nine and three. Yeah. Real shame. Instead, we have Howdy Doody and um, Dumb and Dumber. Yeah, and you, and you know, and I'll be the first one to say, if, if I'm wrong McDaniels long term, I'll be the first to step up and admit it. But I wasn't happy with this coaching decision to begin with, and I'm still not happy with it now, despite the three-game winning streak that, that just got snapped. Still not happy with it. Well, I've been saying that Josh McDaniels is around to stay simply because – Mark Davis doesn't have the money to get rid of him and go get another coach. However, if he continues to have these, I'll say mess ups, because I don't want to have to say explicit on this episode. No, I'll say it. If Josh McDaniels continues to have these fuck up games, Mark Davis will not put up with him long term. I mean, it's getting a little bit ridiculous. Mark Davis might not have the money to get rid of him, but he'll find a way. Derek Carr only threw 20 passes during the game, and only 11 were completed. Devonta Adams had a big catch on the first drive, which resulted in a Josh Jacobs touchdown. But after that, Devonta only had two more catches for the rest of the game, and Derek had two interceptions, one in the red zone which came near the end of the first half. All right, now, the first drive looked great. We got the ball to Devontae. He made that amazing one-handed catch. Uh, the ball went right down the field. We had a mixture of run and pass. Things got into the end zone. I think things started to slow down a little bit, but we still got a couple of field goals out of things. We were still moving a little bit, but they went away from Devontae. I don't understand how you can have a weapon. The caliber of Devontae Adams, the best wide receiver in the NFL, bar none. Again, my opinion, the best wide receiver in the NFL, and only have him have three catches 
and only two more after that one spectacular one-handed catch in the first drive. That's just unconscionable. Uh, that's all play calling. Now, again, there were some long shots that Derek took, which I thought they could have probably done some under the belly of the zone, or you can have some short flare-out passes and let uh, DeMonte run in open space. But Again, it was that Derek, was that the play calling? Was it a difference between the two? I don't know. But there's obviously a disconnect somewhere. Normally, I'm complaining about Josh McDaniels going away from Josh Jacobs. He didn't go away from Josh Jacobs. Josh didn't have a spectacular night, but he still had 99 yards on the ground. But you've got to balance the attack. You can't just throw 20 passes when you have somebody like Devonta Adams on your team. You need to keep feeding him, especially with Hunter Renfro and Darren Waller out of the the game, not returning from injured reserve yet. You've got to go with the two-headed monster that you have, and that is Devontae Adams and Josh Jacobs. Keep feeding them the ball. And Josh McDaniel simply didn't do that. Yeah, you already mentioned this, and I'll, I'll just jump right on that Josh Jacobs train. So, again, he was the workhorse, and he rushed for 99 yards on 27 carries, including that big touchdown at the beginning of the game. But the Raiders kept going to him on short yardage situations later in the game, and he wasn't able to convert. It was almost as if the Rams had it figured out early, and they knew that that's where they were going. So this was just one of the many problems that the Raiders had for the night. Yeah, if they have you figured out, figure something else out. There were lots of opportunities that they could have had a uh, short passing game. They they had some good runs to Mac Collins. Uh, Mac Collins had some catches and some good runs as well. Uh, we were missing a lot of the things that we normally saw, and, and the tight end was completely absent from the game. I was just amazed that they didn't even try any, any shots into the middle. Max Crosby and Chandler Jones each had a sack, and the Raiders' defense had a total of four on the night. And Nate Hobbs led the team in tackles with eight solo and nine total. But a couple of critical penalties down the stretch wiped out an interception and gave the Rams extra time and extra opportunities, which they took advantage of. So I've seen on social media all week uh, who took the blame for this loss. Was it the defense? The defense uh, had boneheaded penalties at the end, and they couldn't stop Baker Mayfield, of all people. Uh, that was on the offense. They didn't do anything in the second half. It was on coaching. I've seen everything. The defense, I thought, overall played a pretty good game. They held the Rams to 17 points, despite the fact that seven of those points came on pretty much the last play of the game. Again, 17 is well below their average. They had some sacks. They generated some good rush, good pass rush, and the amount of times that Max Crosby was held, that wasn't called, there were some times where he was past the lineman and the, the lineman reached around and, and put a, basically put a horse collar on him uh, with both arms and drug him down. There were no calls. And again, we can't blame this totally on the referees, but when you have a, a pass rusher with a caliber of Max Crosby, you at least have to be looking to see how they're going to handle him and control him. There easily should have been at least three or four penalties called holding penalties, uh, which would have negated some of those uh, pass plays that Baker Mayfield had. Yeah, there was one play where Max Crosby was completely upended. And Angria is sitting there watching the game with me, and she's screaming, you can't do that. (laughs) That's not legal. You can if you're playing against the Raiders. I guess you can. It was ridiculous the amount of holding penalties that weren't called. And again, it seemed like earlier in the game, the calls were going the Raiders' way. They were calling penalties on the Rams, but it wasn't something that continued. And Max Crosby and Chandler Jones, they had decent nights, but once again, the holding penalties really made a difference, or the lack of holding penalties really made a difference. Yeah, they gave the Rams opportunities that they should not have had. And I'm not even going to mention the absolute brain dead play that Jerry Tillery made. Yeah. Oh, wait, I just did. (laughs) It was so egregious on the replays I've seen, particularly with ESPN, where they show the replays of of all the highlights of the game. That wasn't even shown. I mean, I've been singing his praises since he came over from the Chargers, and I really think that his play has made a big difference on the defensive line. And it's probably been that play that kept him from getting cut after that boneheaded move. That play and, of course, the Arden Key face mask penalty back in 2020, those have to be the two most egregious defensive penalties by the Raiders that I've seen in many, many years. 
Yeah, pretty bad. So I've got a question. Why can't this team hang on to a lead? What can they do differently going forward? Okay. Now, it all starts with coaching. Now, on the first touchdown drive, we saw a lot of Josh Jacobs, but we also saw the big catch by Devontae Adams. But what I saw is that Josh only gained 21 yards on seven carries on that first drive. The offense was able to rely on other weapons, and it paid off. On the second and third drives, they seemed to get a little more creative at points, but they kept going back to Josh Jacobs, and he kept getting stuff for only short gains or even some losses. The Raiders came away with two field goals where they could just as easily put up two more touchdowns. I know, I know, people over the last few days have been talking about how Derek lost the game for the Raiders with that late first half interception in the red zone, and it was a critical mistake, but if the offense had been able to do much of anything in the second half, it wouldn't have even been an issue. Instead, four second-half drives resulted in three punts, all on three and outs, and one field goal on a drive that started at the Rams' 49. The Raiders' offense only picked up two first downs in the entire second half, As far as the defense is concerned, I blame the coaching staff for situational awareness and not being able to keep these players' heads in the game. And, of course, players have to make plays, especially with the game on the line. How much of the loss do you put on Patrick Graham? This particular loss, I don't put a lot of it on him, but he should have at least called the guys over to the sideline. I wouldn't have minded if they had called the timeout there closer toward the end and just said, okay, guys, keep your heads in the game. Don't let anybody beat you to the middle. Push them to the outsides, and let's keep this thing in there. The pass that went for the touchdown at the very end of the game went the only place it could have gone. And if I'm a defensive coordinator, I'm putting doubles on both those sides and saying, look, if anything is completed in the middle of the field, all we have to do is make a tackle and the game's over. My impression was the game was kind of lost when Josh McDaniels put his faith in the defense and really lost his mind calling plays on the offense. Do you think that he possibly put too much faith in the defense and that was the downfall? No, I just think it it was shoddy play calling. They could have easily picked up first downs. They actually picked up that one first down when Derek Carr did the quarterback sneak. And if you're going to do a quick snap, you do the same thing. You have him run another quarterback sneak. He already proved he could do it once. But they put Josh back in the backfield all by himself with not, without even a lead blocker. And of course, everybody knew where it was going. And of course, they stuffed it. So again, I'm, I'm not sure it's so much the, that he put faith in the defense is that The defense, I don't think, had any faith in the offense. We talk about complimentary football all the time, and you can almost see the guys dropping their heads. It's like, ah, another failure by the offense. Here we have to go back out again. When you have that happen, uh, you start creating doubt in the minds of your players. I think that was really the, the, the turning point. If it wouldn't have been for that quick snap to Josh Jacobs, the Raiders would have been able to run out the clock more, and the Rams would not have had the time to run down the field and score that touchdown. You're right. And then, of course, the Tillery penalty stopped the clock. And, of course, as it turns out, that's all they needed. Made a big difference. So, do we start a new winning streak against the Patriots on Sunday back home at Allegiant? All right. Now, I hope this was a wake-up call for Josh McDaniels and the entire offense that although Josh Jacobs is having one hell of a season, this offense has to utilize more of its weapons more consistently, and you simply have to get Devontae more than just three catches. And where was Foster Morrow? He didn't have a single catch against the Rams, and I saw plenty of green open space in the middle of that field all night. Also missing was that periodic use of the wheel route to Amir Abdullah, which had worked out pretty well so far this season. Mac Hollins even had a couple of nice runs early on, but when the Rams figured out that Derek was just going to pound the ball with Josh, they made adjustments, and linebacker Bobby Wagner was able to come up to the line and make those big plays that he's accustomed to. If the offense can do what they did during the first drive against the Rams, do that consistently throughout the game against New England, and either limit or eliminate boneheaded mistakes, I think this Raiders team is capable of doing something that the Allegiant Stadium crowd is not used to, and that is treating them to a game where they can actually watch the fourth quarter in relaxation and enjoyment rather than biting their nails and gnashing their teeth. As crazy as it sounds, I'm calling for a two-score win against the Hoodie. And I remember a week ago, you had voiced your concern over Bobby Wagner being able to make those plays. And you had pointed out that the Raiders had a chance to pick him up. The Raiders did not pick him up. 
and you were worried that that would come back to bite the writers in the tail. And it really did. I think that I was right on that. Yeah. He made some big plays. He was right on, just like you predicted he would be. And it did bite the Raiders in the tail. It would have been so nice to have him in a Raiders uniform. It would have been. Because he still had some good football left in him. And he's shown that this year. But I also am going to go with a win for the Raiders. I'm hoping that it's a two-score win. And I'm hoping that they don't give up touchdowns in the last few minutes to make it uh, a close game like they've been doing all year long. Uh, The Raiders have not been able to hold on to the lead. Who knows, maybe they will start off kind of neck and neck and have to do somewhat of a a comeback. It seems like the Raiders do better when they're trying to to mount a comeback than they are uh, when they try to hold on to the lead. So... Maybe that's what we'll see against the hoodie, and then the hoodie will ride off in shame. I want to see an angry, aggressive Raiders team. We've got four more games left. I want this to be our playoffs. I want Josh McDaniels to open up that playbook and just pull everything out, pull out all the stops, and just humiliate the Patriots. And I will point out to our fans that the Raiders' playoff hopes are not completely in the dust. Now, the Raiders do have to win out, which I don't think will happen. But if the Raiders win out and the Jets lose three of their next five games, which they did lose one today, we're recording on Sunday, the Chargers lose two of their next five games, the Patriots lose one of their next five games, And the Browns lose one of their next five games, and they lost uh, this morning, Sunday morning. So everyone that the Raiders needed to lose on Sunday so far has. So the Raiders' playoff hopes are still alive, believe it or not. Last year, I said they didn't have a chance So this year, I'm going to say they don't have a chance. And who knows, maybe they will surprise us and they will get help from all these other teams that need to lose. I'm not counting on playoffs. I just want them to wreak havoc on the last four teams that they play. (laughs) It would be nice if, you know, even if they're eliminated from playoff contention, that the final game of the season comes down to the Chiefs and the Raiders and the Chiefs are playing for home field advantage, and the Raiders snatch it away from them. In big fashion. That would be awesome. Yep. All right, T3, why don't you give us your top three for the week? T3's top three. Okay, here is this week's version of T3's top three. Number one. After the game against the Rams, former 2020 draft pick John Simpson was waived by the team. The guard, who just couldn't catch on and who some, myself included, thought might not even make the team when the final roster was put together back in the late summer, now will hope to find a new landing spot and be able to continue his NFL career. Of that 2020 draft, now just two years in the rearview mirror, only Amik Robertson remains. Number two, Max Crosby should undoubtedly be considered for Defensive Player of the Year. And yet, the only name we seem to hear is that of Nick Bosa of the Niners. Through last week's games, Max has recorded four more tackles for loss, double the number of tackles, 73 versus 36, four passes defense, Bosa has none, three forced fumbles, Bosa has one, and let's not forget about Max's block field goal. If Kyler Murray can win Offensive Rookie of the Year on a team with a 5-8-1 and one record a couple of years ago, there's no reason Max cannot win DPOY this year. He simply deserves it. And number three, now that the playoffs are all but gone from the table, it's time to start working Zamir White into the offense more. It's time to see what D.J. Turner has to offer. And it's also time to start working both Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro back into the mix. I would be okay with a 9-8 and eight record, which would include consecutive wins over New England, Pittsburgh, San Francisco, and then Kansas City. We might fall short of the playoffs, but it would definitely be something to build on. And Raider Nation would feel a whole lot better. And that is this week's top three. John Simpson being cut, what took so long? 
Uh, he is not somebody who has played up to the level that he needed to to remain on the team. And um, I'm not sad to see him go. I'm surprised that it did take this long to cut him. And, um, you know, I wish him well. I, I hope he does well wherever he catches on. But his play just never leveled up when he was a Raider. And uh, you could tell the dip in the efficiency of the offensive line as soon as he came in against the Rams. Uh, you could tell that there was a hole there. And he's gone. Good luck, John. Too bad. So sad. Have fun. Max Crosby has got my vote for Defensive Player of the Year. Nick Bosa, I don't know. He's got the Bosa name. Is that what it is? The 49ers have a much better team than the Raiders. Is that what it is? I don't know what it is. But Max Crosby is having a stellar year, and he deserves that Defensive Player of the Year award. And hopefully he gets it. Who knows? Maybe he will, but he probably won't, simply because he's a Raider. And now that the playoffs are pretty much off the table, I really would like to see more of Zemir White. We know what Josh Jacobs can do. He has had a career year. Let's sit him down a little bit. Let's work Zemir White into the lineup just a little bit more. Give him 5, 10 carries. It's not going to hurt anything. It would really be nice to see what we have in him. DJ Turner, I think we kind of know what he has to offer. He's definitely got a lot of speed. But it would be nice to see exactly what he can bring to the table. And Darren Waller and Hunter Renfro, it would be nice to work them back into the mix. Right now, they are on contract to be with the Raiders next year. And we do need to see them back in the fold, contributing and showing what they can really bring to the Raiders after they sign a big contract. Because right now, there's a lot of fans that are questioning both of them. And I think it would just be good to see both of them being out there, contributing, and making a difference. We just need a game to see those guys out there. And I'm sure that when they get out there and perform, as we all know that they're capable of performing, it'll make Raider Nation feel a lot better. And I think a lot of this grumbling will stop. Uh, a lot of this bickering that we have about is somebody faking an injury, should they be out there? Are they just in it for the money? They're cashing a check, and that all needs to stop. Uh, these guys are professionals. I believe in them, and we just need to see them on the field. Definitely. All right, give us a call at 904-701-8667. Leave a voicemail or text message at that number, or send in a message via social media, and we'll share your thoughts. And in Raider Roots this week, what's going on? All right, so we have the 2012 season coming up this week, and then I'm busy working on the next episode covering the year 2013. Now, as we get closer and closer to the present, there's a lot of information packed in there, so the episodes may run a little bit longer, but I think you'll find some interesting nuggets in there that you may not have known. KT3, why don't we find out what we do or we don't know? All right, it's time for another edition of Did You Know? In this segment, I will ask Heidi and all of our listening audience a Raiders-related question with a list of answers to choose from. It's multiple choice, so just give it your best guess. So here's this week's question. Four times in Raiders history, there's been a coaching change in the middle of the season because of losing. But one of these coaches, when he took over to make it a point to his team that the losing culture was over and done with, took his team to a field where they dug a hole and buried a football, symbolically throwing dirt on the losing mentality. Which coach did this? Was it A, Rich Passaccia, B, Tom Cable, or C, Tony Sperano? Oh, great. If it's Rich Passaccia, it's going to be something so obvious that it's going to be embarrassing for me to, to miss, right? I'm not going to give you any hints on this one. Not great. Um, I'm going to say C, Tony Sperano. You are absolutely correct. How about that? Didn't give any hints or anything. He he took the team out, and of course, uh, the team didn't win three games for him. They only finished three and thirteen that year, but they won three of nine games for him. And those twelve games really were his audition to 
become the head coach next year, which he did not get. And we'll talk about that when we get into Raider Roots a little bit more uh, specifically. But uh, I think those are both good episodes to check out and see exactly how this team started to try to put it back together. All right, ladies and gentlemen, it is now time for Heidi's Heroes. When she applied to run the Boston Marathon in 1966, they rejected her saying, women are not physiologically able to run a marathon and we can't take the liability. Then on April 19, 1966, on the day of the marathon, Miss Bobby Gibb hid in the bushes and waited for the race to begin. When about half the runners had gone past her, she jumped in. She wore her brother's Bermuda shorts, a pair of boys' sneakers, a bathing suit, and a sweatshirt. As she took off into the swarm of runners, Gibb started to feel overheated, but she didn't remove her hoodie. I knew if they saw me, they were going to try to stop me, she said. I even thought I might be arrested. It didn't take long for male runners in Gibb's vicinity to realize that she was not another man. Gibb expected them to shoulder her off the road or call out to the police. Instead, the other runners told her that if anyone tried to interfere with her race, they would put a stop to it. Finally, feeling secure and assured, Gibb took off her sweatshirt. As soon as it became clear that there was a woman running in the marathon, the crowd erupted, not with anger or righteousness, but with pure joy. Men cheered. Women cried. By the time she reached Wellesley College, the news of her run had spread, and the female students were waiting for her, jumping and screaming. The governor of Massachusetts met her at the finish line and shook her hand. She was the first woman to ever run the marathon, and she had finished in the top third. Bobby Gibbs then went on to be the unsanctioned women's winner of the Boston Marathon in three separate races. After her feat, Boston Marathon began to accept women runners. If it would not have been for her, the Boston Marathon would not have accepted women runners. Bobby Gibbs, you are a hero. And when I was telling Andrea this story, she said, that's the story that you need to pick because that's some Raider shit there. <laughs> Andrea is right. Absolutely. And of course, it reminds me of uh, the late Representative John Lewis. Uh, he used to talk about good trouble. Uh, this is a classic example of good trouble. And if it weren't for pioneers like Bobby and so many who fought for the civil rights of all people, uh, not just women. And I know that we have some some women that listen to this particular podcast. And, and again, the fact that we can have people uh, that represent all people uh, and, and not only diverse opinions, but, but also just the general diversity of people in general, um, I think the more that we understand that, the more we embrace that, uh, we can continue to move forward. I think Raider Nation does this better than any other group. And of course, when, when I hear people, other fan bases call their group nation, I just kind of laugh and say, you know, there's only one nation. We talk about it all the time. But yeah, this is a great story, Heidi. Uh, uh, kudos to Bobby for being a, a groundbreaker and, and for changing the course of history. Because again, uh, you have to have you have to have a lot of moxie to do that. And I also applaud the runners who stuck up for her. They could have very easily blown the whistle or pushed her off the course as she feared that they might, but they didn't do it. They embraced her courage and they embraced her decision to take a stand and make a change. And that made all the difference. So great job on this story. I, I had not heard that story before, and, and I'm glad that you brought it to the table. Yes, Bobby Gibb, you exemplify Heidi's heroes perfectly. Absolutely. And as an aside, T3, John Lewis is involved in the other story that I considered for Heidi Zero, which will be told another time when Raiders players do not deserve a Heidi Zero. Okay. Well, I will be looking forward to that. Yes. I wanted to pick a game hero this week, but after the Rams game, I just couldn't. And I don't blame you for that. Hey, we, we probably could have could have picked uh, A.J. Cole. I mean, he did everything he could. He pinned the rate Rams back on their two-yard line. What more can you ask a punter to do with a minute 45 left in the game? Actually, had the Raiders won, I probably would have picked him because of that play. That would have been a big play. 
Yeah. And that about does it for this week on the Only Nation podcast. If you'd like to help support the show, you can send in a donation at paypal.me slash onlynationpod. You can find me, Heidi Stabbert, on social media as at Kevlar Prom Dress on Twitter and Instagram or Heidi Stabbert on Facebook. You can also find me on YouTube on Captain Jack Rackham's channel every other Tuesday night. I join the DC wench Peggy Holmes and Angria Trask on Silver and Black Ladies Night. And I can't wait to join you all again on uh, Silver and Black Ladies Night. I'm looking forward to it. Probably won't happen until the off season, but you just let me know and I'm happy to jump right back on there. All right, Raider Nation, as our podcast continues to grow, we would like you on board with us. So here's what we'd like you to do. Send us your name and address so we can send you some free Raiders swag and podcast stickers. Call us and tell us what you want to know. Throw us an interesting nugget that we can use on one of our upcoming episodes and become a part of what we're doing here. Remember, this is the only nation and we want you to be a part of it. So call us 904-701-8667. That's 904-701-8667. Call us now and join the Only Nation podcast family. Now, there are two easy ways to find me on social media. You can send me a tweet at T3 underscore sports 703, or you can hit me up on Facebook at Tom, that's T-H-O-M, Jones. I want to also thank you for your continued support of the Raider Roots podcast. We're getting the episode for the year 2012 this week, and the next week we'll be diving into 2013. Please give me your feedback on the episodes and tell me what you want to know more about. We'll look forward to hearing from you then. Yeah, and if our listeners really knew how much Raider swag I have to give out, they'd probably be sending their names and addresses in a lot more. So come on, guys. I've got some new stuff. So send in your names and addresses, and we will get some stickers and some swag out to you. If you've already done it once, send your name and address in again. We'll we'll double it up for you. There you go. As always, we look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, everyone, go Raiders. All right, we're going to get back on track here. Remember, we're not just a nation. We are the only nation. 